There were two lists, one for each format, but our focus is going to be on the super secret battle rules. These rules required all decks to contain a minimum of 20 Pokemon, 10 trainers, and 15 energy, allotting them 15 cards of Wiggle Room and restricting Electabuzz, Hitmonchan, Scyther, Wigglytuff, Muck, Magmar, Dark Vileplume, Vending Machine Mr. Mime, Rocket Zapdos, Sneasel, Super Energy Removal, Imposter Oak's Revenge, Rocket Sneak Attack, The Rocket's Trap, and all promotional cards to one per deck, while every single non-Neo Pokemon card was restricted to two per deck, as were all trainer cards from every set and all special energies. That last restriction was especially important because it also applied to darkness and metal energy, so even though you could include one Sneasel in your deck, you would almost never be able to use it thanks to only having two darkness in the whole deck. This restricted list was conceptually similar to the short-lived Prop 15-3 rule that Wizards of the Coast would later attempt to implement in the English game in October 2000, which limited players to 15 trainers per deck and only 3 cards of the same name. The difference was that TPC was being a lot more lenient with how many trainers players could have. By mandating 20 Pokemon and 15 energy, TPC ensured that competitive players would have no more than 25 trainers per deck, rather than the 30 to 40 trainers seen in past formats, but that was still 10 more than 15-3 gave them. Putting such heavy limitations on the possible Haymaker cores ensured that they could only be used in complementary color decks like teching one Hitmonchan into Donphan or one Electabuzz into Lantern, and with only 25 trainers and the majority of degenerate cards limited to one each, the optimal trainer loadout became much less oppressive. The end result of all the deck restrictions, baby Pokemon, special energies, and new trainers Neo introduced was the most diverse and skill-based format the game had ever seen, despite all of the coin flips. Players had to assume the default state of their game plan was always a failure state, that they would never get the right trainers in hand and that their attacks would never go through the baby coin flip, and adjust their strategies accordingly to play out across a massive number of turns. Flippy trainers like Super Scoop Up were hard to run when you only got two chances at each before you had to start using Item Finder to play them out of your discard pile. Chaos Gym was basically worthless now that you couldn't get super far ahead before playing it, and the power of energy removals was drastically toned down by limiting them to one and two copies and introducing Eco Gym. A lot of older Pokemon either couldn't be played or had to be run at very limited numbers, which made Neo's damage dealers take center stage at a time when they would have otherwise been playing second fiddle to older decks. There were around 16 mandatory trainer cards that had to be in every deck, which left only 9 spaces for players to change up. You were obligated to run as many of the removal cards as allowed, but also Eco Gym to counter the opponent's removals. You had to run Focus Band for Cleffa Plays and Imposter Oak's Revenge along with Last to disrupt the opponent, and you needed Bill and Professor Elm for draw power. In considering the final 11 trainers of the deck, Gust of Wind and Double Gust were necessary to get control of the match, Professor Oak was necessary to make up for Elm being at 2, Computer Search was the most powerful search effect in the game, Item Finder was the only way to reuse trainers after blowing through your two copies of them, and the very last slot was going to go to either Scoop Up, Pokemon Trader, Super Energy Retrieval, Misty's Wrath, or Pokegear. Some players ran Secret Mission, or Erica as another way of hand filtering, or cut Double Gust to make room for Pokemon Trader and other cards, but these were the trainers you generally wanted to find room for in your deck. In general, it was a really hard format to build for, because of the mandatory fat the regulations wouldn't let you trim and limitations placed on pre-Neo Pokemon. It was also slow, too slow for the 10 minute time limit. Embarrassingly enough, despite all of the changes designed to improve the play experience, TPC was still mandating best of one games and hour long tournaments. In practice, that wasn't ever happening. These were impossible schedules to keep because of the realities of assembling and putting together round pairings mid-tournament. Games took countless turns to play out, and so players had to play very fast and furious turns or be forced into a mutual loss, as there were no sudden death provisions in Pokemon that would force a winner. The World Challenge tournaments were held at a staggering 26 locations nationwide, with TPC attempting to make up for the failures of the lottery system by spreading participation numbers across as many different venues as possible, but those that were there at the time reported tournaments being unable to handle the flood of competitors, with players waiting an hour or more between rounds just to play a 10 minute game. Compared to Magic the Gathering's DCI organized play, the lack of best of three was already inexcusable in 2000. Unfortunately, it wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. Until 2017, all official Pokemon TCG tournaments in Japan were played in best of one, just with 25 minutes instead of 10. And even today, all tournaments except for the Japan Championships are best of one.
This is why you see players like Ito Shintaro at the annual World Championships doing their searches very quickly and not taking much time when shuffling theirs or their opponent's decks. Keeping a high number of actions per minute is extremely important if you want to have time to make critical decisions when it comes to the hard choices later on in a game. An organized play for Pokemon in Japan is only made to address the complaints of general audiences, not to enable the high-level competitive players. The Spring World Challenge was succeeded by the Summer World Challenge from July to August 2000, in a reduced 9 cities rather than 26, and the Summer Challenge coincided with the launch of the second Neo Booster set, Crossing the Ruins. Unlike the Gold and Silver set, Crossing the Ruins didn't shake up the game too hard. It added a new baby Pokemon with an ability to disable Pokemon powers, Iglybuff, and added Foratris as a Steel-type equivalent to Donphan, but as a whole it was upstaged by the expansion that followed in November, Awakening Legends. 